Good evening, everybody. My name is Mark Innet Ponhuis, and I brought a couple of students with me. We got Charles here in the front, we got Reese with a freshly new haircut, and we got Alex. And what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is I'm going to introduce some concepts about 3D printer, and we brought a 3D printer with us. I'm going to talk about robots, in particular soft robots, and I'm going to talk about jelly. But first of all, let me just declare that I am mildly to very severely addicted to surfing. And when you surf, I'm not actually very good at it, but what you do in surfing is you harvest the energy of the waves, and you use that to create speed and do maneuvers. And as Andy Dave has already shown, there are a lot of creatures that swim around in the ocean. As surfers, we like to avoid the sharks at all costs. But there's another creature in the ocean that I really particularly dislike, and that's the jellyfish. If you surf, you invariably get stung by these jellyfish. And actually, when you start looking into jellyfish, you actually discover quite a few things that are very interesting. One is, they are right and left-handed, or similar to right and left-handedness to us. So if you see them on the beach, that generally means that the sailing ones that are slightly slighted to the right have been blown to the beach, while the ones that have been slighted to the left with their float have been blown out to sea so that the species can survive. And if you've had the displeasure of being stung by those, what actually happens is that if you touch the tentacle of a, of a jellyfish, it fires a little dart about half a millimeter deep into your skin. And if you look in this little microscopy image here, that's one dart. One dart of these is covered in 900 million hooks that are all shaped like that. So when you try to scrape this off, you can't really because you're just going to pull this deeper and deeper into your skin. And with these darts, there's about 600 of them are fired per one centimeter of, your, of, of the, the, the stinger that brushes against you. So that's jellies, and we're all familiar with jellyfish. But what about hydrogels? If I tell you that hydrogels are very efficient ways of trapping water, so that if I start walking towards Clive with a glass of water in my hand, and I'm not going to hurt you, <laughs> and I'm going to hover this over him and say, if I tip over this, you're probably going to get wet. Now, if I change this water and actually trap it by just converting it into a hydrogel, which I can do by just simply stirring this, and hopefully I won't get too wet myself, you will find that gels are essentially 99% water and a tiny little bit of polymer that we put in there. And if you notice, if I stir this long enough, it actually has turned into a gel, and now I can quite comfortably walk to Clive <laughs> and actually just hold this upside down because it doesn't leak through my hands. And the reason for that is that these gels capture water. They're also very soft, as you can probably Imagine. And in the lab, what we do, we do a similar process like I've just done with the stirring. And this is actually called artificial snow. And what we do, if you keep your eye on the video, we've put a couple of calcium ions in it, and then we cool our gel. And when it's cooled, it transforms itself from a liquid state to a gel state. And then you can turn it upside down, not as dramatic as I've just tried to demonstrate with Clive, but that's a particular test. And that precise property is also very important if you want to make materials a bit softer. And in particular, what we're interested in is making robots a bit softer. So most common robots that you would find in the workplace, like in this picture on the left here, they're made out of very hard materials. So when they interact with softer materials like this cup, they'll usually end up crushing them. So what we are after is we want to make our robots softer. And we want to do that with hydrogel so that we can get softer movements for robots that can either interact with ourselves, or if we take inspiration from nature, like in the, in the octopus that you see in the picture on the, on the top, octopus are very good at squeezing through little openings. So we want to make robots that can conform their shape to whichever object that they're encountered with. Now, I also mentioned 3D printers, and we got a 3D printer here. The video in the background is one of our conventional 3D printers that 
builds hard plastic materials. And what 3D printing is, it puts layer by layer of material down until you eventually end up with useful structures, like you can build yourself tools that you can use, or in the picture, I'm not sure if you can, you can guess what shape it is, but we're actually printing a batarang, which, thanks to Reese, when I asked him to build me a useful structure, he built me this particular batarang. Now, apart from batarangs, there are some really cool things you can do with 3D printing. And let me illustrate that point by introducing two children to you. The first one here is called Kaiba. When he was born, he had a collapsed uh, tracheo, which means he was not able to breathe very, very nicely. He had to lie down in bed, and that really affected his quality of life. So a four-year-old, if you had a four-year-old like I've had, they like to run around and do stuff. So what some clever surgeons did in Massachusetts, they 3D printed him a structure that helped him open up his windpipe so that he could walk around. More important, the windpipe, that the object that they implanted, could actually transform its shape over time in something that is called 4D printing. And I hope you agree with me, he looks pretty chuffed with himself because he can run around. Now, a few months ago, I was in, or last month I was in Ireland, and I came across a story about this child called Josh. Josh was born without any fingers on his right hand. And what some clever people did at a university in Dublin they gave him a 3D printed hand so that his quality of life immensely improved by this 3D printing. And if you notice the color match between the bike and the hand, he actually, when he got his new bike, he said to his mom and dad, I want the bike to be in the same colors as my hand. So those are just two examples of what you can do with plastic materials. We can also make electronics out of jellies that you can print, and if you notice there, we're already printing some materials. Now, the video is going in the wrong way, but hopefully Alex is going to demonstrate that we can use the jelly to power electronics, and what we're using is just household jelly. If you notice there, you can see the green light is going on, if Alex shows this. And all this is, it's not working too well, but it worked really well at the break, of course. You can see it on the picture as well. All this is is really a bit of aeroplane jelly. So I can very simply come in, and I won't ask anybody from the audience just yet, but since this is normal household jelly, I can just eat this. So it's a form of, of edible electronics. So what about electronics, auto electronics that you can print and eat? And what is more iconic than Vegemite? So if you look in the picture, there was a little video there where we have Vegemite. So it's a bit of a messy job, so I've already taken the Vegemite. And by the way, this is the Vegemite that I took from my daughter. She's not very happy about that, so I will replace that. But if I take the Vegemite and I put it in a syringe so that it's a bit more processable, I can come in and literally complete the circuit. So before I do that, we've got an electrode with an LED. You see the electrode is not on because there's a gap here. And I'm just going to come in with a bit of Vegemite, and hopefully this is going to work. And you see the LED works up. This is just normal, LED, normal Vegemite from the kitchen. You can do this at home, and you can put it on bread, and you can stick LEDs in it and hook it up to a battery, and you can get this to work. You have to do nothing to this. This is fun science that you can do at home. So. I've already shown that we can print this, so if I can take this off, is this ready? Yep. That's ready. So we printed most of the UOW sign of this. We actually missed the UOW, but here is one that we made earlier. So can we light this up? So while Reese is doing that. Now, the reason why you can print Vegemite is because we can spread it on our bread in the morning. So it has a it has a property that it can actually spread, and that's the exact property that we need for a 3D printer, because all that this does, it pushes the material out through a syringe. So hopefully if this timing works, you'll see, and I, will, I am going to ask a volunteer, and Professor Raper has kindly agreed to demonstrate that even the eat the Vegemite. So if, I, if you can see this, hopefully, 
I can complete the circuit on bread. If you are an electronics person, this is like a, a very different breadboard that you would find in the electronics industry. <laughs> now, in order to avoid that, my career at UOW is going to be very short cut. I am going to remove the LED because that's not <laughs> really that good to eat. No, no, I just take a bite just to show that it is actually Vegemite and you can eat this. Thank you very much. Now, very briefly. The reason why, you can, why Vegemite can power electronics is because it has water and it has ions in there. And that's the same that we did with our household electronics. So, let me go on. This is another one where we printed on Sayos, and you see you don't even have to hook proper electrodes on it. You can just hook it up and make it, make it work. But th there are more serious things underlying this. This is the result of a couple of years of research until we eventually realized how we can make electronics with materials that contain water and a bit of, a bit of salt. So let me try to come to uh, the conclusion of my talk. So what I've shown to you is I've talked about harvesting energy. I've talked about jellies, which are soft materials. I've talked about 3D printing, which we can generally use to print hard materials, but we can also do soft material, not just the UOW on bread, but we print tough hydrogels out of this. We can make 3D printing devices that can be 4D activated to make valves. I've talked about the soft robots, so we're going to make robots that are softer, that can conform shape to the environment that they're in. And we also talked about edible Vegemite, which I still have all over my fingers. So what is the connection in all of this? And I apologize, I've put Vegemite on this clicker, but <laughs> thankfully I'm the last speaker. So what is the connection between all of this? So, if you happen to find yourself trapped on the rebuilding, and this is going to be my big idea that I'm going to put out there, if you're trapped on the rebuilding, a person of my size on the normal temperature will have about 100 hours without water before you die. Food is, you got a bit more time. You got about 70 days. So my big idea that I want to develop is a jelly robot. A jelly robot that consists a lot out of water, like the, uh, the, like the hydrogel electrodes that I talked about, that can squeeze its way through on a search and rescue mission, just like a, an octopus can squeeze itself through narrow openings. When it reaches the person, because it has electronics on it, you can use it to communicate or send a message or use it as an antenna. And then once you've done that, the person can eat it. And because the robot consists out of 99% water, it's going to immensely increase survival chances and give people that are looking for the people, looking for these survivors, a little bit more time. If they contain some edible type of material, then that's not that important for survival chances, but it will provide them a bit of comfort. And finally, let me also thank uh, some of the people that do all the work for me. I generally sit in an office and I talk about things, but it's people like Charles and Reese and Alex that actually do the work that we scientists come up with. And of course, without funding, nothing happens. So I also have to thank the Australian Research Council for funding my work, and also Jimi Hendrix for his music, <laughs> and Andy Irons for surfing, and thank you for listening.